I'm Ashley. I'm Jen. And I'm Sarah. And we are Unabridged, the podcast where teachers take on books. Join us each week for bookish episodes and check out our website, unabridgedpod.com, where you can find lots of new bookish content every week. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Unabridged Pod and message us there or see our website to get plugged into the Unabridged community. You want opinions about books? We've got them. everyone and welcome to Unabridged. This is episode 215 and today we are talking about cozy mysteries. Before we get started, I just want to remind you that we do have an active website and blog, unabridgedpod.com, and we have a regular posting schedule. So every Monday, one of us posts a bookish fave. So those are bookish lists centered on different topics. Sometimes those are related to the episodes we've done. Sometimes they're for our reading challenge, but we have a lot of fun putting those together. On Tuesday, we do our pub day shout outs, highlighting some new releases for the day. Wednesdays are our show notes days, of course. And then on Fridays, we post a book review. And then we have some other posts here and there. But We have a lot of great content on our website as well. We invite you to visit unabridgedpod.com. You can also subscribe to our blog and information about that is right on the homepage. So yeah, so we are going to go ahead and get started with our bookish check-in. Ashley, what are you reading? So this is when I just started today and I am captivated by this story. This is Kaysen Callender's King and the Dragonflies. So I read Felix Ever After by Calendar before and absolutely loved it and was eager to try another. I'm listening to this one on audio and it is King is that central character. And right at the start, we see that his older brother passed away unexpectedly. And at first we don't exactly have any idea how that happened, but just know that he lost his brother Khalid just a couple of months prior. And so of course he is absolutely grieving. It was just him and his brother with his parents. So he is an only child now and he's feeling that loss really acutely, but he also is comforted in the idea that he has that his brother is a dragonfly and that he has shed his skin, like his human skin, but he feels he saw the dragonfly first at the funeral and his brother visits him in his dreams. And so he, and his, there's kind of some backstory also about his brother's connection to dragonflies. And so he acutely misses his brother. He is grieving, but he also feels this deep connection. So there's this place that he often goes where there are dragonflies and he doesn't know if his brother is still there and is one of the dragonflies, but he finds himself going there every day and spending time among the dragonflies. And so it's really, I mean, it's just lovely. That part is a really lovely idea and an interesting part of the story. And he's only 12. So he also, you know, his friend groups, everyone's sorry for what happened, but he is very, young to be navigating that at school and with friends. And so we also see that happening, that he's kind of trying to figure out where he fits with his friend groups and how he should handle all of that and how to navigate that space. And so the other thing that happens that comes up early is that he had a he has a best friend, Jasmine, but there was a third best friend, Sandy, and King is Black. Sandy is white. This takes place in Louisiana, just about three hours outside of New Orleans to the deep south. There is a lot of racism. There's a lot of racial tension. And yet the three of them are good friends. But he learns that Sandy, and this happens very quickly in the story, he learns that Sandy is gay. Sandy kind of trusts him with that secret that he is just starting to come out. And yet his brother, this is prior to his brother dying, his brother Khalid essentially doesn't say anything super judgmental in a negative way, but he basically is like, you can't be friends with him anymore, is essentially what he says. Well, then Khalid has that attitude. That's not really King's attitude. He feels comfortable with Sandy being gay, and yet Khalid's attitude about it is coloring his actions, especially because Khalid dies. And so then he's like, he just stops being friends with Sandy. And so 
we have this broken friendship that had been a really close friendship prior and then the loss of the brother. And so he's navigating all of that. And as the story is unfolding, his the, the other best friend, Jasmine, is asking him about why he stopped being friends with Sandy. And he does not want to unpack that information. He does not want to navigate it. He knows he's doing the wrong thing. I mean, it's a situation where he knows what he's doing is wrong. He knows it is hurtful. And yet he can't figure out how to navigate his way through it. And so, I I mean, it's the things I love about calendars of what I loved in Felix Ever After. There's a really great internal component where we're really getting to know King and navigating his internal thoughts. And yet we also see him making some really painful and wrong decisions. And, you know, you as the reader are feeling for him, especially amid his grief. And yet it's awful to see how he's making these wrong choices. And so that's happening at the beginning here. So I haven't read much at all, but I am really spellbound. I just think it's a great story. And it's touching on some really important topics for kids. I think that this is probably middle grade. I didn't look it up ahead of time, but I would say so far it reads middle grade. And I just think it's really talking about friendship groups and navigating things like grief with your friends and how to support people as they discover their identities and their sexualities and what impact that has when you do or don't support someone. So I am loving it at very beginning, but the audio is great and I'm looking forward to getting back to it. So again, that's Case and Calendars, King and the Dragonflies. Oh, that sounds so good. I, I've had that one on my list for a while because it was award-winning the year it came out. It won a bunch of ALA awards. And so I've seen the cover everywhere and just have not, just have not gotten to it yet. I have it to say that so some good. parts of it remind me a lot of Emily X. R. Pan's The Astonishing oh. Color of After. And I that was one that I raved about a lot when we read it and when, you know, that at the time. And I mean, it has some of that as far as just the idea that of navigating grief and what that can look like and how to stay connected to the people we love. I mean, all of that, I thought it was reminiscent in some ways. So yeah, I'm loving it. Good. Sarah, how about you? What are you reading? I have a holdover from December that I am still navigating. It is Emily Stone's Always in December. I really like the story. It is about Josie and she lost her parents when she was young and she, <laughs> the, the store, the book starts with her going through a really tough breakup and she is trying to navigate that. And then she is also navigating that in December is what December around Christmas time is when she lost her parents. So she writes them a letter every, every December. And so she, this particular December where she's, where she's also going through the breakup, she's riding her bicycle, which that is, she, she and her friend are having some wine and then she decides she wants to post her letter right then. And she gets on a bicycle oh, no. and is like <laughs> plowing through the streets and she runs into this handsome stranger who she, she ends up buying him a drink and all this stuff because she has plowed him to him with her bicycle, but he'll be there, but then he disappears and without saying goodbye, but then he'll show up again. So I am, st I don't know why it's taking me so long. Well, I do because I'm just not reading as much, but I really like the story and it's very compelling. And every time I read it, I'm like, I just want to know what's going to happen. But so I'm going slowly through it, but I don't, so I don't know why he keeps disappearing, but it's just, uh, it's a good story. It, the book kind of reminds me of One Day in December by Josie Silver and also The Two Lives of Lydia Bird, also by Josie Silver that I re I've read. They, it has that feeling. I feel like it might, I think maybe one of the reasons I haven't like plowed through it is because I'm scared it's going to be sad. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so I'm, I wondered about that in the, <laughs> with the opening part. Uh -huh. so, I don't know. So I think maybe I'm also reluctant for the heart wrenching part. That's one of the reasons I'm plotting self preservation. <laughs> Sometimes I have to know with that stuff. Every now and again, I get in a situation with that where you just don't know why the thing is happening, where I just have to Google it. And yeah, sometimes that brings me some comfort or it yes. just helps me, helps me prepare either way. Yeah. But yeah, it sounds great. Yeah. That sounds so good. Jen, what are you reading? So I am reading a book that I am absolutely loving, but I am dreading describing it. So I'll just lay that out there. It is Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn, 
which is the first in a fantasy trilogy. And it is a long book that has a lot of world building. So I'm going to just skim the tiny little top of the surface because yeah, it's going to be tough, but it is in a world where there is a Lord ruler who is just this horrible singular ruler who is cruel and seemingly immortal and unstoppable. And there is an upper class that is really well established in the society that is, of course, is subject to his whims, but definitely has power over the underclass, which they are called the Ska. And they are basically treated as if they are enslaved. And the upper class creates a situation where they, their lives are so grueling that they can't possibly think of rebelling. And then there are two main characters. So one is Kelsier, who used to be just a normal human, but he was trying to lead a rebellion. He was thrown into this pit. And because he was in the pit, he became a mistborn, which is someone who has these magical powers, basically. And now he is using those magical powers to try to foment another rebellion and to, yeah, bring about the end of the rule of this horrible leader. And the other character is Vin, who is a teenage girl who is part of the ska. And basically she and her brother made it through the world by living with criminals. And she does not know it, but she is also mistborn. And so she eventually, through this long series of events, gets to meet Kelsier, who then starts training her to become a part of the rebellion. So I, I think that's as far as I dare go, because if I start digging in any deeper, you're all going to hit pause or fast forward or something, but it, it's great. It is fabulous. It's the thing I love about fantasy that it is this deep world building. It's very immersive, but yeah, it's just hard to describe succinctly. So I will <laughs> spare you all any more detail. <laughs> that sounds really compelling and like the kind of thing I would enjoy. Yes, I think you would. We just will never describe it again. <laughs> All right. Well, we are going to shift over now to our main discussion and we are going to talk cozy mysteries. So Sarah, what is your cozy mystery you would like to recommend? So I read Mia P. Manansala's Arsenic and Adobo for my cozy mystery. I love a cozy mystery and this was awesome. It, again, it, it combines some of my favorite things, food and, and a really <laughs> good story. So this is the story of Lila. She moves back home after she's had this horrible breakup and her life is just kind of in a huge upheaval. And her parents had have died when she was younger. So she has been kind of raised by her aunt and her grandmother and her aunt Rosie has a restaurant, but it's kind of failing. It's a great restaurant. The food's great, but it's just, they have a hard time making ends meet. And her ex-boyfriend from high school is also a restaurant reviewer and he's known for being kind of a jerk and he comes into the restaurant and they're all very nervous. He comes into the restaurant to have a meal and review the restaurant. And he ends up dying at the table. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and so <laughs> what ensues is the the local cops trying to do an investigation, but then also Lila kind of taking matters into her own hands and becoming an amateur sleuth to figure out what happens because all of the signs are pointing that her family is involved in this murder because he is a horrible <laughs> restaurant reviewer and also her ex-boyfriend. And yes, there is a death and, but, but it's not that it's not too sad. <laughs> and because you, you get the impression that this guy is not the best and it's just really sweet. I love the aunties who are all, like in the periphery of everything. She has all these aunties that kind of like act kind of like a hen house and are trying to <laughs> set her up with guys and want her to get married. And then her grandmother, who is like this no nonsense lady, it's just a great cast of characters and 
I just really enjoyed it. I love the description of all the food and I thought that it was the perfect cozy mystery. I love that like amateur sleuth trope that people who things happen to and then they are trying to investigate it on their own. I just loved it. It was great. And it was perfect. If you just want to like nice little mystery, there's no gore or anything like that, except there's the murder, but it's not nothing. (laughs) (laughs) But there is nothing that is super grisly or anything like that. And it's just really sweet. And I loved it. So and it's, uh, it's going to be a duology. So this is book one of two. And it's a Tita Rosie's kitchen mystery. And that's the series. So it was really great. I loved it. Sarah, that sounds awesome. I, I want to read that like, like <laughs> right now. Uh-huh. <laughs> it sounds really good. It was really good. I've been seeing it everywhere on Bookstagram for a while. And I, I love the cover so much. I don't know why I haven't picked. Yeah, I always say that. I don't know why I haven't picked it up yet. But uh, yeah, that sounds great. I didn't actually know what it was about. I still don't gravitate a whole lot toward Cozy Mysteries, but I do love them sometimes. So it is, it's nice to get good recommendations for them because I think that the ones that work for me, I mean, it's kind of like romance that I'm still learning the genre and learning like which ones I really love and which ones are not a great fit for me. And so when I get the right ones, they're just awesome. That sounds great. I think you would love this one, Ashley. And I actually, so it's funny, I saw it on Bookstagram as well. And I read the the reviewer's description. I was like, that sounds great. So I actually went on Libby on my library app and I was able to check it out right away and listen to it. And I mean, I just loved it. I couldn't wait to get back to it when I wasn't listening. So it was great. Mm -hmm. And it was great on audio too. Cool. All right. Well, Ashley, what book would you recommend? So actually mine has a lot of similarities to yours. Sarah, in the sense that there is a murder. The person who dies is a definitely a bad person. <laughs> People do not like the person. <laughs> it's not grisly. There's there's some good similarities here, which is why, and I loved it. So I think that was part of why I am so excited about yours because I'm like, I want to read that because I really enjoyed this one so much. And then I haven't, I read it a little while ago and I haven't read it any other Cozy Mysteries since, but this is Abby Colette's A Deadly Inside Scoop. And this one also is part of a series. It is the Ice Cream Parlor Mystery. And this is the first one. So <laughs> they does sound very similar. I mean, I mean, it also has connection to food and <laughs> and there's a family establishment. It's an ice creamery instead of um, a restaurant. But I mean, you know, they have an ice cream parlor and all that. So yeah, I think there's a lot of similarities. And like I said, I absolutely loved it. I mean, it was such a great read. And I listened to it on audio, Sarah. And the audio was awesome. So this one is about Bronwyn Cruz. And she lives in an Ohio town that gets a lot of snow. And which is relevant because of the ice cream and also because of the murder incident. <laughs> <laughs> so she, the Cruise Creamery is a family ice cream parlor and her grandparents ran it and her grandmother has passed away and everyone really misses her. Her aunt ran it for a period of time and her grandfather, Pop Pop, is not like a huge fan of how that all went. <laughs> and so eventually... Pop Pop hands the keys over to Wen. Bronwyn goes by Wen. And he hands the keys over and he also gives her the recipe box that was her grandmother's that everyone thought was lost. And so he really is just showing that he has a lot of faith in her and her ability. And she has a lot of training as an entrepreneur and as a business person. But she hasn't really had a chance to like try that out. So she gave it a run. She did some things that were in a different place. And then she wanted to get back closer to her family. That just wasn't a great fit. So she comes back to Ohio where her family is. And then she takes over the running of the ice cream parlor, but the, the parlor needed a lot of renovations. And so when she starts taking all, and she has all these great ideas also, but she's trying to like bring them to fruition. So she's having like a window put in that over has this really beautiful overlook and some of those kinds of things that are major. Because of that, as we all know with building renovations, sometimes that stuff takes way longer than you expect. So she had hoped for this like summer launch, but instead it's October and also they're having an early snow. So as time comes for the launch to finally happen and she's ready to open the doors and you know welcome everyone into this renovated space, there's a huge snowfall. And so then she's contending with how people are less likely to eat ice cream when it's super cold outside. And so she's trying to navigate that. 
So in her figuring out how to bring people in, she gets all these great ideas that are kind of Halloween related. And so she stays late and she decides she's going to go get some fresh snow from a place that would be really pristine so that she can make some snow cream. And when she goes to do that, she trips over something hard. It is a body. <laughs> <laughs> It's so funny how often we are laughing about the murders here, but I feel like yes. that's consistent with cozy mysteries that like, it's amazing that these horrible things happen, but also it's, it's funny and light. And so she trips over a body and initially she thinks the person just, you know, fell or had something like had a heart attack or something and therefore died. And then the snow covered them. And so she reports it, but she's not really thinking anything sinister about like how the person died. But as things unfold, it's again similar to your Sarah in the sense that not only has a person done a lot of bad things to the town, but specifically to Bronwyn's family, there's this really awful history. And she had seen the guy once prior to his death. And when she mentioned that to the family, she didn't know this like horrible history with him. But when she mentioned it to the family, her dad said, I will kill that man if he comes around here again. So of course, that makes her dad a suspect because they can't figure out what happened. There are some like medical components that are in use with the crime, with the way that the man dies and her dad works in the hospital. So like all these things are kind of stacking against her dad. And so because of that same, same thing that you said, Sarah, amateur sleuthing, she is kind of reluctant to be a sleuth, but she has this awesome best friend, Macy. And Macy is gung-ho about the <laughs> sleuthing. And so there's some really great secondary characters in this book. I loved, I loved her pop-up. I loved her parents, but I also loved her friends. She has a couple of really great friends who are involved in helping her with the ice cream parlor. There's also somebody who lives upstairs. There's just a lot of really great secondary characters. So I loved that. And then the other thing that I thought was really great in this story is that there was this compelling mystery happening, but there's also this really interesting examination of her as an entrepreneur and as somebody who is trying to get this ice cream parlor running and what that looks like. And so I loved that too. I thought that there was just a really nice blend between the mystery that was interesting, but also her experiences as a young businesswoman and like trying to find her way and help the ice cream parlor be successful. So I thought it was great. I absolutely loved it. And that's why when you described yours, Sarah, I was like, yes, yes, please. Because <laughs> I, like I said, it's been a while since I read that one and I would love to read something else that has some of the similar vibes. Cause I just thought this one was great. So again, this is Abby Collette is the author. She was, a, this is the first book I've read by her and it is a deadly inside scoop is the name. And I loved it. Oh, that sounds so good. It was really a good one. Well, I briefly looked at my Libby app and that I just checked that one out for my library. <laughs> yes. Yay. That's so funny because I was going to do the same for Arsenic and Adobo. Because I was like, yes, I really want to read that. What about you, Jen? <laughs> What's your recommendation? So I've had quite the journey with this recommendation, which I will share, but I will just say, I do not read a ton of cozy mystery and I like it fine, but it is not like Ashley said, it's not a genre that I gravitate toward. So I went to book riot and I remembered that they had had several lists of cozy mystery recommendations. So I went and the one I chose is Jesse Q Sutanto's dial a for aunties. And I read it. I loved it. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And then after I read it, I realized I'm not sure it's, it's a cozy mystery because so I found one definition and I can link all these articles in the show notes, but I found one definition that said cozy mystery genre has rules, no graphic violence, no sex, no swearing on the page. This one doesn't have tons of graphic violence, but it does have sex and it does have swearing on the page. So there's I've never also heard that. I didn't, I didn't know that. This is like fascinating. I had no idea. And you know, again, this is one article, but I definitely found that there's also like, we know from the beginning who did it. So there's actually not technically a mystery. The mystery is how is the main character, Medi Chan, going to get away with the murder that she did? So what happens is Medi Chan, she has gone to work as a photographer with her mother and her aunts. And at the beginning of the book, so I listened to this one on audio, which I would highly recommend. But at the beginning of the book, she has this note and she talks about 
the languages and the accents she has included in the book. And I'm just going to read just a little bit from my review on Instagram. So she describes the book as a love letter to her family. The family in the book is a big Indo-Chinese family. And Sutanto talks about the ways that her family members switch between Indonesian and Mandarin and English, all of which are broken in some ways. And the way that she is straddling a very fine line between authenticity and stereotype and that this is not representative of the Asian culture as a whole. So I heard that, you know, right up front. And then definitely the audiobook narrator, whose name is Risa May, portrays that. So it is a vivid listening experience. But Medi works with her mother and her aunts, and they have started this wedding business. So Medi is the photographer. One of her aunts is this like semi-famous singer. So she provides the entertainment. Her oldest aunt is a baker, so she makes the wedding cakes. One, I think her mom makes the wedding dresses. And then one of the aunts does hair and makeup. So they each have their own little niche within this business. And they are gearing up for this huge wedding on a, an exclusive island that is going to bring a lot of money and a lot of advertising or a lot of promotion to their business. So that's what's happening in the present day. It is flashing back to Medi in college when she had this amazing romantic relationship with this guy and we see why it ended up having to end and why Medi made the choice to not pursue that romantic relationship, but instead to go work with her mom and her aunts. And a lot of it has to do with just this loyalty she feels to her family. Her mother and her aunts all had horrible experiences in their marriages. And so none of them has a man in her life anymore. And so Medi very much sees the sort of fate coming for her as well. But despite her family's bad luck with marriages, her mom and aunts are determined that Medi should get married. And so her mom signs her up on a dating website and pretends to be Medi oh and does not understand how emojis work. And so anyway, <laughs> I, I don't want to spoil too much, but I'll just say it is hilarious. But what ends up happening is Medi is set up on this blind date that the date thinks she set it up, but Medi did not set it up. The mom did. So she goes on the blind date. <laughs> The guy basically attempts to assault her and Medi accidentally kills him as a result. So she was defending herself, but now she has this corpse she has to dispose of. And so she calls her mother and her aunts and they come and help her get the corpse from where it is. And they take it back and they aren't sure what they're going to do because they have this big wedding coming up over the weekend. So, <laughs> so the aunt stores it in her freezer where the wedding cake is and it's accidentally taken to the wedding location on this exclusive island. It is completely over the top in the absolute best way. I mean, you have to suspend disbelief in a major way. There are some definite weekend at Bernie's moments. <laughs> there are some things you find out about the couple who's getting married that are just hilarious. There are twists and turns in this plot that are completely ridiculous, but also completely surprises. And it is so much fun. And the guy that Medi broke up with in college does enter into the plot at a certain point. So you sort of see these two storylines working toward each other. I highly recommend this book. I highly recommend it on audio. I am not absolutely sure that it's a cozy mystery, but I decided to talk about it anyway. So yeah, so that is Jesse Q. Sutanto's Dial A for Auntie. I definitely want to read that one. It sounds really awesome. fun. It is such a ride. Oh my gosh, you will just love it. And <laughs> I, it was one of those that I was listening and laughing out loud, which, you know, in front of my family makes me look very strange, but they're kind of used to it by now. So, <laughs> so it's a great one. I definitely want to read both of yours now. I feel like we all just came away with instant downloads yeah. for our audio. I did already put the arsenic and adobo on hold. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, we would love to know what cozy mysteries you would recommend, how you define cozy mystery, because I realized that I don't have a firm definition that is my own. And yeah, if, if you think you'll listen to any of these three. So we are going to close out our episode today with our Give Me One. And our topic today is animated movie or TV show. So Ashley, what would you recommend? 
Yeah, I I wasn't sure. Sometimes we don't talk about these ahead of time, listeners. So I wasn't sure what we meant. You know, like this is one that my kids love. This is a series that they really love that I wanted to share. So they're young and I don't sit and watch it. It is definitely made for younger people. And then also I will do a movie pick as well. So Molly of Denali is a show that my kids really love. And it's one of the PBS shows. It is really great, but it also has a podcast and they love the podcast even more. It's a storytelling podcast. Podcast, so like it's kind of an ongoing, you know, mystery story that they want to find out what's going to happen next. And the kids love that, especially. So I wanted to share that because it's it's just it's really well done. It's really great. It's set in Alaska. Molly's family is native Alaskan. And so there's a lot about her family and their heritage that's woven into the story. So I just think it's just really well done and I really love it. But again, I have not watched all of it. I'm, this is all like secondhand that I'm like, oh, I like that. Oh, that's really cool. But a movie that we all watched and loved that just came out in 2021 is Wish Dragon. And that one is on Netflix and it was great. Our family really enjoyed that. I'll have to share that with my kids because they are always looking for new ones. Although I kind of think my younger son has already watched it, but I'll have to ask. Yeah. So Sarah, how about you? I'm going with Coco. I was trying to think of an animated film that I loved in the last while because my kids are older. So we don't, we watch more like family films, but not a lot of times they're not animated, but we went to the theater and saw Coco in 2017 when it came out. And oh my goodness, I, I thought it was one of the most beautiful films I have ever seen. And I just adored it. But I was also bawling when I left the theater. <laughs> I still have not watched that movie. I need to watch oh it. Gosh. Yeah. It's so beautiful. It's so good. Jen, what's yours? So I'm recommending a series on Netflix that my family just all watched together that was phenomenal. It is called Maya and the Three. So it is set in pre colonial Mesoamerica. And Maya is a teenage girl who lives with her mom and dad and her three brothers and her parents rule their kingdom, but otherwise she has a fairly normal existence. She's a fighter. She is really funny. And then one day she is visited by this God who tells her that she needs to sacrifice herself or they're going to destroy her family's kingdom. And her brothers jump to defend her So something terrible happens, and I will just say this is not for tiny kids. It is pretty intense at times, and there is violence, and there is death in the show. And But yeah, so then they start learning about these prophecies, and they thought that the prophecies meant one thing, and they actually mean another. So Maya goes on this journey to find warriors to fight with her to both save the kingdom And so that she does not have to sacrifice herself. The storytelling is rich. Every episode focuses on a different character and you get their backstory. It is gorgeous, gorgeous animation. It's funny. It's sad. It just had all the things. But again, my kids are 11 and 14. And I felt like, you know, much younger than that, there would be some things that would be really tough to wrestle with. So just that reminder that animated doesn't always mean accessible for super young audiences. But yeah, I highly recommend this for kids and adults. So that is Maya and the Three on Netflix. Well, and that made me realize that I have not said, I feel like this is something that we watch, I mean, almost weekly at my house. I forget that it's still pretty new, but Raya... If you have not seen that, oh, yes. it is phenomenal. So that is one that did come out in 2021. And so it's still pretty recent, but it is just a phenomenal movie. So well worth a watch. Yes. We love that one too. It was so good. It's so good. It just it's really, yeah, it's really well done. And I mean, I think just, you know, centers a really strong female character who is a fighter and is courageous and it is more accessible to younger audiences for sure there are some parts that are scary but my kids kids are very sensitive and they did okay and there are bad things that happen but everything works out in a way that is manageable for young kids so all right well we would love to know what animated movies or tv shows you would recommend and so on monday tune into our instagram account at unabridged pod and you can share your recommendations thank you so much for listening Do you have comments or opinions about what you heard today? We'd love to hear them. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Unabridged Pod or on the web at unabridgedpod.com for ways to support us. 
To get more involved, you can sign up for our newsletter, join a buddy read, or become an ambassador. Thanks for listening to Unabridged.